High in the mountains of northern New Mexico, between Santa Fe and Taos, lies a most unique land. These are the villages held in the embrace of La Jicarita Mountain, small enclaves settled by Pueblo Indians and Spanish and Mexican explorers centuries ago. Today, the descendants of settlers, explorers, and indigenous people of southern Taos County live here in harmony with the traditions and customs passed down from generation to generation. A proud people whose roots are deep in the land they love and have a foothold in both the modern world and the history of their rich culture and heritage. These are the people of the Rio Lucio, Chamasaw, and many other small villages surrounding Penasco, New Mexico. I'll real quickly introduce myself again. Uh, so I'm Miguel Torres. Uh, you can find me as Mike, Michael, uh, various names. Um, I work in Los Alamos. I'm a research technologist. I live in La Mesilla. My family has been, um, my mom's family is primarily from the Santa Cruz area, Chimayo area. My dad's family migrated to Española from, from Mora in the 1950s, but his family is, his, his mother's family is extremely connected to this region here throughout the Peñasco areas. So I have a deep history in this area, although I don't have, the relatives I have here today are probably very distant, but yet, nevertheless, they exist. My dad's family was from Rancho de Taos. So basically, f from if, if anybody's familiar with genealogy, your roots basically are not from one community. They really spread out, and we're really all intertwined, and we're, we're all primos in some way or another. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this project that I have that, that is run by the New Mexico Genealogical Society, and it's a genetic genealogy project. And... Um, so what that really does is it incorpor incorporates traditional genealogy when one traces their family tree. We see a lot of examples here on the tables. You, know, you, you research your family and you create these uh, genealogies on paper, names, you put names and faces to, these, to, to history, but at the, then we use genetics, which is, you know, we, genetics is fairly new. It's, you know, 20 to 30 years old, but we've really been using it for genealogical purposes in the last 10 years. So it's very, very pow powerful, and I'll, I'll go into that later. So um, let me get this slideshow started. So I'm going to run through this really quickly. So if you have questions, feel free to interject, and I'll, and I'll stop, because I'd much rather answer your questions at the time than for you to forget or not be able to answer them correctly. Um, so here's our logo. That's our genetic genealogy project. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I ha um, I'll tell you how you can find our project. I have cards. So if you just Google this, NMG NMGS DNA project or New Mexico DNA, you'll find this. It's not that hard. There's, you'll get a plenty of hits on the internet. So it's, uh, uh, it's not that secret. It's very, very accessible. So as I mentioned, DNA is used uh, to validate genealogies. I'll talk more about that. So DNA is science and it can be very complicated and a lot of people don't understand it. So what I try to do and is, is break this down in the most simplest format as possible. And so what I do is I try and take the basics of DNA, which we can see on the left is, you know, it's very complicated. And then on the right, it's a simple approach by using, you know, the family tree approach. So genetic genealogy tries to answer these questions or i try to answer these questions or i'll talk about them what is genetic genealogy why do we even care about it and what can it do for us those of us who are interested in our own history um, so genetic genealogy is the combination of traditional genealogy paper trails and dna testing um, so like i mentioned traditional genealogy is you go back into records you look at land records sacramental records um, civil records that means baptisms marriages those kinds of things help us to build our family trees. Oral histories do that, and before you know it, we, if we're lucky enough, we, build our, we, we learn what our history is. Um, genetic genealogy takes that information and uh, we, we use genetic sampling to look at those specific lineages that we're interested in, and that'll become clear hopefully here soon. Um, so what it's really helped us to do is compare surnames so there's a lot of people in New Mexico, or let's just say, we were talking earlier about Roybal. Realistically, there's only one Roybal family in New Mexico. There was 
one or two brothers, whatever, I, can't, I can't forget the exact uh, specifics, but these guys, these Roybal, this one Roybal family came to New Mexico and generation after generation, they populated and migrated to different parts. We have them here, we have them in Taos, we have them in El Rancho. They're very, very prolific in El Rancho, Santa Fe. But there's one family, so what we can do with DNA is we can take a sample of a Roy, different Roy balls to see if and how they match and confirm that they're legitimate. So if we make a, so um, what I like to call is uh, basically defining a Y DNA sequence. It's a paternal line. We define it through DNA. We get this DNA sequencing code. As long as the genealogy is true and we can use that as like a, a baseline and we can get other Roy balls to test to see if they match that. It's, it's not easy at first. We have to get a lot of samples from various lines to actually get to a point where we know what, what, what we're looking at. Um, so you can compare families with the same surname. You can validate genealogy. So like I said, if you, at some point, so let me put it this way. The Martinez family, Martin Serrano, that is very, very well defined. We're actually writing an article and it'll be published here real soon in September. Um, so we know who the Martinez people are of New Mexico. If anybody, if there is a Martinez out there who's interested in learning if they are legitimately a Martinez, that you can do a DNA test and there's already a sequence out there that'll tell you if you are or not. So you can compare surnames. We, we find this all the time, especially in small communities, you'll get people of the same surname and they'll say, oh, we're not related. Well, in most cases they are, it's just distant. Um, so it's always a perspective of what you consider uh, a relative. Uh, I consider fourth and fifth cousins my primos. My wife, on the other hand, uh, maybe second cousins are the closest that she'll consider related. <laughs> Uh, so when it comes to DNA, there's basically three different types of tests that we can, that we look at. Y DNA is, so is only found in males. It's a Y chromosome and it's a, it traces a direct paternal line. So women cannot test for this, only men. So if a woman is interested in her father's lineage, she cannot test for it. It has to be done by her, a brother, or if her father is still living, and let's say she doesn't have any brothers, and her father is deceased, she, she can do her father's brother or, fa or nephews. Any male descendant of the exact same lineage can be done. And what this looks at is it looks at, like I said, direct paternal, father to father to father to father to father. We all, anybody who's done their history or knows history, um, especially in genealogy, knows that there are a lot of cases of illegitimacies for various reasons. Sometimes kids were adopted by other families, sometimes, um, the father was away working and somebody came into the house while he was away a lot of secrets so one of the things that i have to caution with dna is if anybody's interested in doing a dna you have to be very open to the possibilities you can't have hurt feelings okay mtdna is the exact opposite it traces a direct maternal line and it's the x chromosome so a male and a female both carry that so either a male or female can test for their mother's line. And what it does is it traces the mother's, 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 mother. An interesting point on that is that data that we have to date with this, it hasn't changed over the last 10 years, is that 80 to 85% of all maternal lineages are Native American. And it's very consistent with history. So the first Spaniards that came to the new world didn't bring many women. So they mixed, initially they mixed with the women of Mexico, and so then by the time various settlements came to New Mexico, there was already a lot of mestizos coming to New Mexico. Or for those families that were recently migrated from Spain to Mexico and came to New Mexico without much interaction in Mexico, um, they mixed with native populations here. And so, and that, those native populations range from Pueblo Indian to Apache, Navajo, uh, there's various settlements like Penasco and like, um, or Picuris and like Abiquiu that had a lot of influx of, of other tribes because they were like trading centers. So there was, you know, those populations exist, you know, had um, Kiowa, Chippewa, Indians from Plains Indians that were captured and brought here. So the genetics are varied. Um, now there's a, a, a third test, which is autosomal. I don't really, I've done it and I, I think it's interesting and it has its uses, but our project doesn't focus on it. So if anybody tested and joined our project with strictly autosomal DNA, it wouldn't be of a benefit and I wouldn't be able to help you a lot other than maybe some consultation, but I wouldn't like really support you with your genealogies just because it's not our focus. And what that is, is autosomal DNA can be done by either a male or female. And what it looks at is it looks at your, both sides of your family 
for the last, and it has an accuracy with real, with, within five generations, but it'll look deeper in history. And what it does is it does a, fair, a few things. It'll give you your personal ethnic percentage based on what you've inherited. So let's just say, um, so it'll look at your, your mom and your dad, your mom's mom and dad, your great grandparents on all, all grandparents. So it, it looks at all the different ancestors you've had and what you've inherited from them. It doesn't specifically tell you what you got from each one, but it'll tell you, so in, in exam, as an example, my autosomal DNA tells me that I am 60% European. So that's a combination of various ancestors that came from Spain. I'm 30% Native American. And 10% of that 30% is actually, it's, a, it's closely related to the Asian sequence, which tells us that that has to be uh, inherited from Navajo and Apache, Navajo or Apache ancestors. Then I have about 13, 15% um, North African Arab, which historically that's gotta be inherited from like the, the, the Moors that were in Spain. So those, some of those ancestors that came to the new world claiming to be Spanish or of Spain were actually of Moorish origin. Um, then I have a small percentage and it's not, it's not, it's very typical. So my, my percentages I'm giving you are very typical of the North of a, of a new Mexican, of a, somebody who can trace to colonial New Mexico. I've got like three or 4% uh, African. Okay. So that's what it is. And it's really cool. Cause it gives you a personal look at who you are and where you come from. Um, and it shows how diverse we are. And so that's really cool. Cause I like, I, when I talk to the kids in the schools, I really like to tell them, uh, talk, teach them about diversity because you know, racism is a very hot topic and people are, you know, this and that and whatever. And then I look at that and I say, you know what? We're really all mixed of some sort. And it's our perspective of who we associate with and what we, so we're really, I associate as a Nuevo Mexicano. That's who I am. And I associate, I know I'm a mestizo at some point, but I'm not, I don't associate and I don't participate in tribal affairs and things like that. Although I know I have that heritage. I am basically, I just consider myself a Nuevo Mexicano, which is made up of various uh, parts of history. Uh, so when we're testing our lines, I don't know if it's clear from your point of view, but if we look at this, the, the blue guys are obviously males and the, and the red are females. So on the very bottom, it just so, it shows the male samples, female samples. But then if I put some names to this, let's just, as an example, show the very bottom, we have Joe Martinez. And I'm gonna move this here so I can get a better angle. So on the bottom, let's just say, this is hypothetical, this is not true whatsoever. I, this is not a true genealogy. If we have the bottom guy, Joe Martinez, and he's interested in learning whether he's a true Martinez or not, he can test his Y DNA. Joe Martinez's, according to this family tree, shows that his father, we follow the, the line, Juan Martinez, and then Juan Martinez going up, it's out of, out of the focus there, is, um, is Jesus Maria Martinez, and then Miguel Martinez. And so we would basically be testing those lineages and then whatever comes prior to that. Now, if we wanted to, perfect. So if we wanted to test, um, where's the button for this? Oh, there we go. So there's uh, his wife, Angelina Vigil. If she wants to know about her history, I said she cannot test her, her father's line because she doesn't inherit y y the Y chromosome. So if her father is living, she, here's her father, he can test, but let's, okay, so let me back up. I made a mistake here because this is a perfect example of an unknown line. Okay, so let's just say, so Angelina wants to test her maternal line or her autosomal line. Well, with her YD and her maternal line, her mother is Isabel Cisneros. Isabel's mother is Maria Romero. Maria Romero is Bersave Rodriguez and so on. So from a female perspective, what we realize is that the surname, we're not associated to a surname on a maternal line. It changes every generation. Okay, if she tested her autosomal DNA, she would be looking at her mother's and father's line. So she would be looking at both of these grandparents, these grandparents, and her father's grandparents and grandparents, great grandparents. That's what she would be looking at with autosomal. So that's pretty interesting. Autosomal will also link you to other people who have also done the same type of test. So it'll predict your relationship between another person. And here in New Mexico, that's amazing because we're so related that we're full of primos when, when we get these uh, DNA samples and a lot of times we don't know how, but because we all come from the same families, it's just logical that it, we're related. Okay, so here's a good point. So Angelina does not know who her father is. So 
she can't test her father or her brother because if she doesn't, you know, she would know that information. But if she did an autosomal DNA test, she'll pick up, even though she doesn't know who her father is, she's going to pick up re other relatives that have tested for that same lineage. So she, may, she has a potential to figure out what family line that is. It, and it depends on the closeness of matches, and I'm not going to go into that. I can talk about that one-on-one. So, there's, so autosomal DNA helps with uh, figuring out uh, who, who uh, certain ancestors are that we don't know about. So, okay, so if we want to know about Joe Martinez, like I said, he can test his Y DNA. If he wants to test his maternal line, he can do the X chromosome. He's going to learn about his mother, Rosa Duran. Her mother is Lucia Archuleta. Lucia's mother is Dolores Garcia and so on. And like I said, most of the time, this maternal DNA lands up being Native American. But what's interesting about not just Native American is it has a lot of potential to match other people of the same lineages. And, let, and so what it does is a lot of times it breaks down our genealogies when we get stuck, both male and female lines. Um, so let's just go back and hypothetically say that this Miguel Martinez, we do not know who his father is. Is he a true Martinez or not? By Joe testing his Y DNA, we can answer that question. If Joe DNA matches the known Martinez DNA, we may never know who Miguel's father is, but we will know that he's, it, maybe the record is just missing. The church fire destroyed the records for that generation. We don't know. Well, the DNA can answer. So it can just make the dotted line to the Martin Serrano family. So he'll know somehow, some way he's legitimately Martinez. He just doesn't know how. It, it answers that question. Or it can tell us the reverse. It'll say, okay, Joe Martinez is not a Martinez. He's actually a Leyba, right? Okay, so then you go back to the record and say, well, why is he matching the Leyba? All of my records from his generation to this generation and this generation are all there, so everything's in place. But since we don't know Miguel's father and he's matching the Leybas, we can assume that Miguel's father was a Leyba. If we go back, that provides a clue because when the researcher was looking at Miguel in the documents, he was looking for Miguel and Miguel only. All right. Now that you know about a Leyba, you can go back to the records and say, let me look and see if there's any association with this guy and any Leybas. You may find, and then uh, it's happened many times, it opens up possibilities, and then you start saying, oh, well, look at Miguel, is, he's living, his, his mother, we figure out who his mother is, and she's living right next door to Pedro Leyba. And you figure, okay, it, things start becoming, <laughs> right? There's a lot of those cases. Um, so that's, that's the general quick overview of how this process works. So um, does anybody have any questions? You know? Okay, so in New Mexico, New Mexico was populated, I think, in five different settlements. So if you know your history, Juan de Oñate settled New Mexico in 1598. That population of people that came to New Mexico, not a lot of them stayed. A lot of them left or were killed or whatever the case may be. There was this particular population that stayed from that generation until the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Then those people that were not killed in the revolt and, re and were able to escape went down to what's near uh, Juarez today. It was called El Paso del Rio del Norte. They stayed there for 12 years until Don Diego de Vargas brought some of those families back, but he had to recruit new families because of the families that escaped. A lot of those families weren't willing to come back. It was too dangerous. So he got, so he brought back some of the old families, like s some of them are Martinez's and Salazar and a few others. Um, what he had, what de Vargas had to do is he had to recruit new people. So there was a settlement, um, they call it the, it's a uh, va Farfan expedition of 1694, 95, I forget. A lot of those people came from Mexico City. So it was a whole new introduction of people f to this region. Um, the Juan Baez Hurtado expedition of 1695 recruited a lot of people out of the Zacatecas region. And lo and behold, a lot of those people are identified as mestizos. So a lot of them have not only ma maternal ancestry that's native, but they were actually Native American themselves paternally, whether first or second generation. Um, there's many families like that. I'll talk a little bit more about the, the names of some of these families. And uh, so, so the, that Don Diego de Vargas period brought a whole group of people, new people, and that's primarily the group of people that we as New Mexicans descend from. Some of the old families, but, very, but not as many as the new families. And so we have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, Native American DNA from that time period. And after that, I'm going to 
there were there were really small migrations of people that came after that but realistically not many families that entered New Mexico stayed here there was people that would come up to trade and stuff like that but it was very very uh, few families that actually stayed and created a presence in Mexico in here in uh, in New Mexico right off the top of my head one of the families that came much much later was uh, there's a Gonzalez family um, there's a morphine morphine family didn't come to New Mexico I'm sure you've heard the name morphine morphine didn't actually come to New Mexico until like the 1830s or 40s and that's after the Mexican period so after so when Mexico declared independence from Spain in 1821 it opened up new possibilities for people from Mexico to come here so that's a uh, and but there are some families but it's not a whole lot New Mexico didn't change much until after 1840s when American American and fur trappers well, uh, fur trappers came like in the 1820s um, started entering New Mexico there's a lot of families in New Mexico like Branch um, uh, Ferran. There's a lot of those families that came into the Mora region. Actually, I have one on my family line. It's their Arts, A-E-R-T-S. The Arts. Um, there's a small family that exists from them. But anyways, so this small group of people came in that gave us a little bit of diversity in our genetics, uh, but it's not big. And then, lo and behold, the, um, the Americans, the Americanos came. And, you know, but primarily... New Mexicans stuck with New Mexicans, and if you do your genealogies, you might have a little bit of uh, non-native, uh, non-New Mexican lineages, but it's not much at all. So, with that being said, so I, it's very hard to see here, but I just wanted to give you an example of how we compare genealogies with DNA when it's the same surname. So we've got two examples here. So there's this guy here. Uh, I left his name private, uh, but he's a Silva. His genealogy traces back like this to the Antonio da Silva who came after de Vargas or with that time period. And then there's this other Silva and he traces, he's got his own genealogy that's separate until it links here. So these two guys that did a DNA test have genealogies that link at Jose Leon Silva who was born around 1771 in Tomé. Okay, the samples from each one of these guys matches identically. So what it does is it proves without a doubt the DNA of this, of this guy, Leon, because the DNA is traced paternally. So what it does is it, sh it shows that these guys have a true genealogy back to this person. Well, then we trust the records from here back. But recently we've had other Silva's test from, so this first guy that came, Antonio Silva, had a son, Francisco. Well, he also had another son. Uh, I forget the name off the top of my head. Well, there's like two or three other samples we've gotten recently that come from the other son. And they're, all the DNAs are matching. So you've got two brothers at this generation and descendants today are all matching, which is basically proving the DNA of this Antonio Silva. So that's, that's how this process work, works. And it, the same thing can be done for a maternal line, but it's a lot more, it's a lot more difficult. Um... I just wanted to throw this in here. So our, pro our program has, um, so when you DNA test through our program, you, you buy the test, you send it off to a company. I don't do the DNA testing. I'm just a consultant. I basically have a database and I, I relay information to you. Um, our project, we have a team of what we call genealogist uh, validators. So basically you submit a genealogy as best as you can. We take that information and I give it over to my team and I, I do a lot of it myself, and we double check the genealogy that ha you have. Let's just say that anybody that's in this crowd has, well, let's just say a genealogy that's on, this, on these poster boards. Um, there's, a, there's a Roy Ball family out there. Let's just say that that lineage tested. Well, they already have a family genealogy. What they would do is pretty easy. They would just transpose that information into our form, send that into us, and we would go to the records that she indicates, confirm her lineage, and validate that she didn't make a mistake or that that lineage is not incorrect. If it's not incorrect, if all the sources and everything there, it's a real quick process. Let's just say that at one generation in, in 1800, she couldn't figure it out and she assumed based on logical assumption, the next generation. Well, then our team would not validate that. We would stop wherever we can 100% validate to. So even though she has a tree to the, the very first family, our process would stop there, but her DNA could confirm the rest of the way. Or we would be able to prove that the lineage per documents goes all the way back. Um, that's, we have a team of researchers that, that does this. It's all free. Basically, you're just paying for your own DNA test, and we help you. 
There's another project we have within our organization and it's uh, our society. It's called the Primeras Familias. So people are very interested in having this really elaborate certificate that shows your connection to one of a found uh, to a founding family. So that's a little more stringent. Ours is stringent, but this is more stringent in meaning that they require at least two or three proofs for every generation. So let's just say in this example, this is one of uh, this Ed Silva. Okay, he was born in 1946. He supplied his information and he was awarded the certificate. Well, so he has to provide at least two documents that prove that Romaldo is his father. He may have his baptism certificate. He may have a confirmation certificate. There's various things. It's usually pretty easy in the current generations. But if we were to go back to generation four, Antonio Silva, born 1858 in Sabinal, Ed, Ed Silva would have to prove to us with three, at least two or three different records how Antonio, how he proves that Antonio is the son of Juan Antonio and Juliana Abeta. So it's, it gets a little stringent. He has to, but by doing so, what happens is that you, you, you basically validate without a doubt your genealogy and you get, this is not their certificate, this is just like a print of it. A really elaborate certificate will be awarded to you. This project actually, you're, you have to pay like 40 bucks to get the certificate and you're really paying for the certificate in, in the frame, not, not for the research. So, but our DNA project and this project go hand in hand because when we're trying to validate genealogies, in a lot of cases, these people who have, are doing this have also DNA tested, so they go hand in hand. Um, so, I, just to reiterate, our goals are to validate gene, uh, genealogies with DNA. I won't read that. Uh, how do we accomplish our goals? So, the way we accomplish our goals is we need people to test. And this has been our project, the New Mexico, the NMGS DNA project has been in existence since January of 2015. However, I collaborate with, and I'm very good friends with this other fellow uh, who runs the New Mexico DNA project. And he's, he's had that project since like 2004. And it's basically essentially the same thing, except that the other project really focuses on how the DNA relates to people's history from a more anthropological perspective. So he looks at like families, like let's just say the Trujillos. The Trujillo's DNA comes back as a population group J. And so J can be found in the North African Arabs, but it can also be found in the Middle Eastern Jewish population. So what this other project does is really focus on the DNA sequencing code back in Spain in that time period. He looks at genealogies and cares about what lines are what, but that's his focus area. Ours is obviously has the same focus area, but we're more in tune with actually proving the genealogies themselves and we so, so the other project doesn't help you research, he just relays information as far as the results. We do both. So, but when somebody joins our project, I always encourage them to join both projects. So we need people to test and supply genealogies to make all these comparisons, to give people who are interested a fair analysis. Um, so one of the surnames that we've been testing recently, it took forever to get people with the Frescas name to come forward. And we really only have three samples of Frescas and they, none of them match each other. So something's wrong, so, it, it, so nothing is understood about the frescas whatsoever, okay? So we need more frescas to test and supply their genealogies, we'll help you. I just got an email from a frescas earlier um, this week and right away our team is so excited that we, we researched his line and within two days we had his lineage 100% com uh, confirmed. However, his lineage dead ends around 1760s or 70s here in Picoris, I forget the fellow's name, I have it. Um, and it says on the record, let's just say it's Juan, Juan Fresquiz Genisaro. So right in that record, it's telling you that he is a paternal, he's an Indian. And Genisaro was not given to mixed bloods. Genisaros are usually given the title to a full-blooded Indian living the lifestyle of a Spanish person or a Spanish community. So this, so... If this Frescus is willing to test, which I think he is, he's gonna test, but we're assuming he's gonna be testing for a Native American line. He shouldn't be matching the first Frescus that came here. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I have other um, samples and they're not matching, but we need more people to come forward. And that's one, one example, the Frescus. There's a lot of other surnames out there that, that we don't have a lot of data for. We have a lot of data on Martinez's, Vigil's, Trujillo's, um, Torres, the Torres surname is very well defined. Um, there's, I already wrote an article on that that's, that's out there. Um, Leyba is pretty well defined to a particular point in time. Espinosa, there's a lot of info. Sanchez, there's a lot of, so, huh? 
No, tell you, go ahead. Oh, talking out loud. No, so if there's any certain things you're interested in, I can tell you right, right off the top of my head, I can tell you what we do or don't know about these families. Rodarte. Rodarte, there are, there's not a lot of DNA on Rodarte. So that's what we need to make us comparisons is we need Rodarte to test. Um, so we need, not only do we need the sample, but we need genealogies. And so we, like I said before, we have a committed group of people that are there to support and, and check the genealogies. Um, we need multiple samples, like I said before. One, two, three frescas. If, if all three of these frescas have, had tested and all matched each other, that would be really good data. And we'd be like, we pretty much know what's going on with the frescas, but we don't. So in order to make a fair comparison, we need multiple samples, not even two. We need more than one. It, it has to, it's a build up, a combination of, of samples that really tell us what we're understanding. Uh, let's see. We, so uh, to accomplish these goals I mentioned, um, our project, so, so Family Tree DNA is the company that does the actual testing. And, and our project is a project within Family Tree DNA. So we don't collect money, you order your test, you can order it through our project, but it, the money and the samples come from Family Tree DNA. They do the analysis, they upload your information into a database, which I have access to, and then I become your consultant. You have the same access I do, except that I should know a lot more and be able to help you understand it. Um, there's a couple things that we need when you join our project. You need, there's a form, it's called a join form. And basically you fill out your information, uh, Joe Martinez, I'm giving Miguel Torres permission to look at my DNA sample. And the only reason is, is because when your DNA results come in, there's different levels. You can, um, like some of these people I've mentioned before, like Frescas, I don't have, the Frescas only want me to talk about their results with people that they match. Well, I can talk about it publicly in a general, but I can't tell you which Frescas tested and for what exact line, not yet. Until he signs his release form that tells me, you can share this publicly with my matches only or how I can share that information, then I get specific. And most people are very willing to share their stuff in the open. There's very few that are reluctant. Um, so you, miss, you submit a join form and then you submit your sample and you submit a genealogy. It doesn't have to be complete. Even if it's only two generations, we take it from there. That's, that's our services to you. Um, in the Martin Serrano uh, case, We've got over 30 Martin Serranos who have tested and matched. And that's various lineages all over New Mexico. Many lineages coming out of Abiq, here in Picuris, out of Taos, out of Santa Cruz, Chimayo, Santa Fe. It's enormous the amount of information we have on Martinez. And it's, it's very obvious, right? You, you go into any community and there, there's Martinez everywhere. So they've really populated north, uh, northern New Mexico. And... Um, Montes Vigil is the same. We probably have, this number says we have 10 samples matching. We're probably up to like 15 or maybe even 17. And, and, and those are just a few examples. Well, let me just, so I'll tell you the Martin Serrano, the paternal line, we're validating genealogies, but another thing you get to learn from it is, like I told you before, what population group does it descend from? I told you the Trujillos are matching. We're not sure if it's North African Arabs or Middle Eastern Jews. There's not enough information out to tell. Martinez's are paternally what's known as Western, Euro pe Western European people. And that's very common. Like 60 some percent of Spain today is made up of this group of people. It's just a very common DNA that's found in Spain all the way up into England and Ireland. It's very common. And so, so Martinez's have a very, Martinez in itself, the paternal line is very European. The IP37 is mine. That's Torres's. So the Torres, paternal line is IP37, which is Nordic. So that is a Germanic DNA. So the paternal line of the Torres people is Germanic. They came from Spain. So they had lived in Spain for who knows how many generations, but their ancestors had migrated from some region, from the Germanic type of people. And historically, what makes sense is that Spain was occupied by th this type of people during the Visigoth and Vandal time period in history. I forget if it's Visigoths or Vandals, but one of those groups of people are, are the ones that took over the Romans. So, that, so the Torreses logically come from that group of people and then eventually landed up in Spain, which eventually migrated to this part of the world. So, that's, so you can learn this. The Espinosa DNA is Native American paternally. The, the, the Espinosa who came to New Mexico in 1695 is listed as a coyote and other times as a mestizo. And DNA, a, big, a DNA study has shown that the paternal line is Native American. It's not European. 
there's I can talk about many, many families like this. So if you have an interest in any surname, feel free to ask and I can tell you what we know. How much time do I have? Okay. So So okay, so here I was gonna give you um some <clears throat> some you don't have to write this down. If you just Google my name, you'll find me. It's, it's almost impossible. I have cards outside. Um, it's, you, there's, there's no way you can miss this. Uh, what I wanted to do is, the next presenter is uh, Jero Arwell, and he's created this lovely book, uh, Pioneering Community. It's on the history of the Trampas. But as we know, anybody who knows their history here, all these families and communities ar around this region are all interrelated. And so, you know, you, if you have the hills in Penasco, Somehow, some way in history, they're related to the Vigils and the Trampas or in Truchas. Well, so from this book, some of the, found, the founding families here are Arweos. I'll let Gerald talk more about what his DNA has shown about that. Um, Leibas, we have Rodriguez's, Bacas, Dominguez, Garcias, and we have a lot of DNA on all these families. So, you know, I'm not going to present to you what the results are here, but on an offline basis outside, come talk to me. If you're from a Garcia family from here, I can tell you what we know about Garcia's, etc. So um, with that being said, it's very short and very quick. I, I just gave a talk last week at Los Luceros for the Mesa Prieta uh, petroglyph project, and I was very detailed in that one. And I went two hours, and they had to cut me off. That's how much people have questions and keep going. So feel free to ask questions. One last thing, I plugged it at the beginning, but I'll say it again. I was part of a team that did this uh, book for the Santa Cruz Church. It's I got a book and a DVD. It's it's forty dollars. It's its value is at many people have told me that we're selling this for very very cheap for the effort for the amount of information however so 100 percent of the sales proceeds goes to the church we don't make a dollar off this so it's a hundred percent uh fundraiser for the church so if you're interested buy a book comes with a dvd you get a free poster and santa cruz de la cañada i call the corazón of northern new mexico because if you've got roots in mora taos picoris peñasco rodarte it doesn't matter you have families and history in santa cruz de la cañada so it's a very very um, it's 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 has a relevance to all of northern new mexico thank you